I have a word from the Holy Spirit this morning, and the word from the Holy Spirit is it's time to structure for your future. Now, I want you to look at me today because uh, I have a lot to share this morning, and I want you to hang with me because there's good wisdom from the Holy Spirit uh, for you to receive at the beginning of this year. It's time to structure for your future. Look with me in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Greek-speaking Jews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not pleasing to God that we should leave the word of God and minister at tables. Therefore, Brothers, choose from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they lay hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Beloved, I want to tell you that it is urgent that you get ready for what God wants to do in 2013. It's urgent that you get organized for the opportunities that are about to open up for you. It's urgent that you get ready for the new relationships that are coming into your life. It's urgent that you get ready to receive the provision that God is about to pour out on you. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. When I was praying on New Year's Eve, I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say to me that 2013 is going to be the year that the reward of the Lord is going to be released on those who have been faithful. The Holy Spirit kept reminding me of that verse, let us not be weary in doing what is right, for in due season we shall reap if we don't give up. Harvest time, I want to say you've been faithful. You haven't given up. You've taken every opportunity to do good to all men and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I don't know what 2013 holds for others, but I can tell you what 2013 holds for you. It's your year to receive the reward of the Lord. Jesus said in the natural, it doesn't look like it's harvest time. It doesn't look very promising. But I tell you, look again, it is harvest time. He who thrusts in the sickle will most certainly pull back his hand with reward. God is about to pour out his blessing. And it's important that you and I get structured to receive it. In the days of Elisha, there was a prophet's widow. Her sons were about to be enslaved by the creditor. She and her husband had been faithful to the Lord. They had hidden the true prophets of Yahweh in a cave and fed them during the wicked reign of Queen Jezebel. The widow had liquidated everything that she owned except for her husband's horn of anointing oil. When Elijah asked her, what do you have left in your house? She said, I have nothing left except an anointing of oil. She refused to sell that because it was sacred to the Lord. She had been faithful to her husband's call, even in his death. She didn't know it, but she was about to receive the reward of the Lord. But before she could receive it, Elisha told her, go gather every empty jar in the city. What was he telling her to do? He was telling her to assemble structures to receive the blessing that God was about to pour out. And beloved, I believe that God is ready to pour out this year. So let's assemble structures in our life so that we can receive what it is that he wants to give. 
Acts chapter 6 represents a significant turning point in the history of the early church. The stage is being set for the church to expand its mission. The church is about to go global. They're about to expand their territory. They're about to expand their numbers. They're ex about to expand their reach and their impact in the world. And in order for them to do that, they had to structure for the future. And as I look at Acts chapter 6, uh, I find three areas that the Holy Spirit is highlighting for you and I to get structured for 2013. And I want to share them quickly. I want to say to you this morning, if you're in management, if you're in administration, if you're in leadership, if you're in business, if you're in ministry, I want you to listen carefully because there's a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit for you to receive today. Three areas to structure for your future in 2013. The first one is this. Structure your thinking for future growth. Structure your thinking for future growth. Beginning in Acts chapter 6, God had to change the thinking of the apostles so that they could achieve the global mission to which Jesus had called them. Their thinking was too small. Their thinking was too provincial. It was too ethnocentric. It, it was too religious. And so God had to use a, a number of different means to push them to a new mindset. Beloved, can I tell you that sometimes God has to give us a push too. I remember when I first became the senior pastor of Harvest Time Church, I was invited to a special meeting in Buffalo with an apostle from Australia named David Cartledge. David Cartledge gave birth to a great renewal movement in Australia, and he planted the Hillsong Church. Maybe you've heard of it. At the end of the meeting... David Cartledge laid his hands on me to prophesy over me. And one of the things that he said to me is, you have to change your thinking. And after that, the Holy Spirit began to help transform and to renew my mind. Beloved, listen, in order to structure for your future, you have to change your thinking. A couple things I find here. One thing I find is that we must learn to see the potential power of Problems, the, the positive power of problems. Can I tell you that many times problems are actually indicators of your progress? In Acts chapter 6, there's an acceleration in the momentum of the early church. Up until now, Luke says the church grew by addition. The Lord added daily those who were being saved. 3,000 were added to the church. 5,000 were added to the church. Many were added to their number. But in Acts chapter 6, the language changes. In Acts 6, 1, it says, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying. In Acts 6, 7, it says, the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. In fact, five times in the first five chapters, Luke uses the word added. Five times in the next five chapters, he uses the word multiplied. A shift of momentum occurred. And because the church was now growing by multiplication, new problems arose. In the days when the number of disciples was multiplying, a dispute arose. The church started as a very small group of Galilean Jews. Then it expanded to the natives of Jerusalem and Judea. Now the church was reaching Greek-speaking Jews who had retired to Jerusalem. It was precisely because they were making progress that they faced new problems. And so it is, as you look at 2013, you're wondering, why is it that I'm facing problems that I've never faced before? Why am I experiencing problems now in areas that were previously problem-free? It's because you're in motion. 
It's because you're not standing still. You're, you're on a move. There's been a change in your momentum. There's been an acceleration in your effectiveness. You've actually started to achieve some of the goals that you set out to achieve. And progress always means that there are new problems to address. Pastor Nick says it this way, new levels, new devils. <laughs> Denise and I have been here at harvest time for 16 and a half years. This month I'm starting my 15th, month, 15th year as the senior pastor. And thanks be to the Lord, we've made a little progress in that time. When we began, we had under 300 people. We had two pastors, we had two secretaries, we had two services and two rusting vans. Now we have over a thousand people, 11 pastors, eight services in two languages, now three languages at three locations, a 10 acre campus, a 25,000 square parsonage, one rusting van, and an air dome near a pine tree. See, all that progress means that every day there are new problems that I didn't have in 1996 or in 1999 or even a year ago. The Friday before Christmas, I, I drive my kids to school every morning, and the Friday before Christmas, I left our house, and, and I got to the corner here, and I noticed that every fire truck in the town of Greenwich was here in our parking lot. So I turned in to find out what was going on. Pastor Kevin had locked himself out of his apartment in the wee small hours of the morning, so he came and slept on a sofa here in the building, and he's standing there in the foyer blinking like a deer in the headlights surrounded by every fireman in Greenwich. We put in a new parking lot last year, and apparently there is a puncture somewhere in the underground conduit that holds the wires for the parking lot lights, and it filled up with water, and the water started pouring in the basement of the building all over the electrical panels. It set off the alarm, and so the firemen were here, and then the fire marshal showed up on the scene, and he decided to do a little walkthrough of our building. And every possible violation you could imagine, we had. Every fire door in the building was propped open with a rubber stop. We had things stored where it's not supposed to be stored. So the fire marshal said, guess what? I'm closing this building, and I am rendering it uninhabitable uh, until you correct all of this and until you get letters on file with the building department that uh, everything has been resolved electrically and with the alarm system. It was the Friday before Christmas. The building department was closing at noontime and they weren't reopening until January 2nd, which means seven weekend worship services and two Christmas Eve services and seven worship services the next weekend and New Year's Eve, none of which we could have. That was a problem that I didn't have in 1999 when we didn't have a building. Problems don't mean that we've necessarily done something wrong. They exist because by the grace of God, we've done something right. Our needs keep changing, and so we must keep changing with them. Learn to see the positive power problems. Problems alert you to defects that will impede your further progress. They let you know early that something's not right. Something needs to be adjusted. Something needs to be changed. Jesus had called his apostles to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, but we find out in Acts chapter 6 they were woefully unprepared for that mission, both psychologically and organizationally. They were unprepared to minister to fellow Jews living in Jerusalem who had come from different cultural backgrounds, let alone to minister to Gentiles living from Spain to Siam. In Jesus' day, Jewish people lived in communities across the entire Roman Empire. They only spoke Greek. They didn't speak Hebrew or the local derivative, Aramaic. Those who could afford it retired to Jerusalem. The weather was fine in Jerusalem, and they wanted to be buried in the holy city in anticipation of the resurrection of the dead when Messiah came. The apostles were Galilean Jews. They and the natives of Jerusalem spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, the language that was used in the temple. So there was a language barrier, Pastor Helio. 
And it was so great that the Greek-speaking Jews had their own synagogues where they worshipped in Greek and in the temple they spoke Aramaic. And when the Greek-speaking Jews began, began to accept Jesus, they felt like second-class citizens. I don't know whether you've ever been in a situation where you're at a table and you're the only guy at the table who only speaks English and everybody else speaks English and Spanish or English and Portuguese and they try their best but they can't help it. They switch from English. They speak Spanglish. They speak, I don't know, Portuguese English. I don't know what you call it but they, they try their best to accommodate you but they can't help themselves switching over to their native language and you feel, you know, all scumbari sitting there like you don't know what they're talking about. Beloved, I want to tell you that Luke has given us the real history of a real church. We find out that from the very beginning, favoritism and cliques and prejudice and the problems associated with blending people from different backgrounds, the balance of power in the congregation, who, who decides, what's the decision-making authority and process, the handling of church money, we find out from the very beginning these were issues. The problems alerted the apostles to the fact that changes had to be made in order for the church to go on and fulfill Jesus' call. And problems serve the same functions in our lives. They signal to us it's time for a change. They alert us to the fact that there are shortfallings in our thinking and in the systems and structures of our lives that will hinder our further progress if we don't do something about them. Learn to see the positive power of problems. Problems push you to make necessary changes. Beloved, don't ignore problems. By the time a problem has boiled over, it has probably been simmering for a very long time. Don't ignore it. It won't go away on its own. Don't belittle your problems. Don't become defensive. Don't try to assign blame. The apostles didn't answer offense with self-defense. They took responsibility, they looked forward, and they found a solution. Don't suppress your problems, address them. Problems are only positive if they push you to take positive action. So as we stand on the threshold of this new year, I have a question from the Holy Spirit. What is God trying to communicate to you through the problems you're facing? What are they trying to tell you? Do they indicate that you've made some progress? Do they alert you to some deficiencies that need to be addressed so that you can make more progress? Does God want to push you into making necessary changes because of the problems that you're facing? Structure your thinking. Uh, another thing I want to say before I move on is this. Realize that constant change is necessary in your life in order to maintain consistency. Now, everybody look at me. I want you to grab this. You're fasting, so I know your brain power is, you know, you're, you're, you're grass. Listen, listen. Get this, because this is good preaching right here. Constant change is necessary in life for you to maintain consistency. Luke shows us the journey of a church that was constantly evolving. They were constantly reorienting. They were constantly reorganizing. They were constantly revising and restructuring, and so must we. You know, sometimes when a church moves from addition to multiplication, people become uncomfortable. They say, you know, it just, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. The reason it doesn't feel the same anymore is not because things have changed, but because things haven't changed. The leaders haven't restructured. They haven't taken steps to make sure that the quality of ministry is consistent to larger numbers of people. So just like in Acts 6, somebody gets overlooked. Multiplication of people means that the church has to reorganize to keep its core values viable. It's not the restructuring that changes the product. It's the lack of restructuring that changes the product. Are you with me? Good, because there's a valuable principle for life. I'm talking about church growth, but you can apply it anywhere in your life. Look at me. Throughout life, you must make constant changes in order to maintain consistency. 
To put it another way, whatever it took to get you here will not be enough to keep you here, and it certainly will not be enough to take you up from here. Maybe it'll help if I illustrate it this way. My twins turned 11 yesterday. They were born on January 5th, 11 years ago, several weeks premature. And from the very beginning, one of the goals that we had was to feed them optimal nutrition for health and for growth. At the beginning, that meant feeding them prescription formula because they were preemies that cost $250 a month. And then as they started to grow, we began to make changes to their diet. Those of you that have been through it, you know how great it is when you start slipping a little cereal into their formula with the last bottle of nights so that they get something in their stomachs and actually sleep for maybe a five or six hour block and you can get some rest. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and then we began to introduce solid foods to them. And then we took them to the pediatrician for their one-year checkup. And I literally, I had my door on the, my hand on the, the door handle to leave. And the pediatrician said, oh, by the way, you can take them off the prescription formula and you can switch them to regular milk. I started speaking in tongues. I got a $250 a month raise right there. But all along the way, we've had to make constant changes to what we feed them in order to maintain consistent progress towards the goal of feeding them optimal nutrition. Do you follow me? And it's true for you too. You have to adopt the mindset that constant change is required in order for you to maintain consistency in your walk with Jesus Christ, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your career, in your finances, in your physical health, to keep your goals, you will have to constantly change it up. You have to constantly evaluate and innovate and recreate. And if you're experiencing diminishing returns in your life right now, if you're disappointed with your results at the moment, if you're dissatisfied with your relationships, it's probably not because you've changed, but because you haven't changed. It's time to structure your thinking for future growth. Three ways to structure for the future in 2013. Number two, structure your resources for long-term stability. Structure your resources for long-term stability. I should have said long-term sustainability. We commonly associate this passage with the selection of the first deacons. Actually, that's not at all the case. Nowhere in these verses are these seven men called deacons. Only the related word diakonos for ministry or service appears here. Seven Greek-speaking men were chosen and they were installed by the apostles as pastors to the Greek-speaking congregation. Much the way that Pastor Melanie pastors our Spanish-speaking congregation, and now Pastor Helio and Pastor Rafael uh, pastor our Portuguese-speaking fellowship. But by restructuring, I find seven precious resources that the apostles preserved. They preserved momentum. They preserved the unity of the body. They preserved the bond of peace. They preserved their ministry reputations. But let me talk, talk to you very quickly about one or two of them. First of all, by restructuring the leadership of the church, the apostles conserved their precious resource of time. The new leadership structure helped them to manage their time better. It prioritized their time. They said, we can't do this and that. So we're going to do this, and we're going to delegate that. Beloved, more than ever, the challenge of modern life is that we're constantly being pulled to do both this and that. There are a million things vying for your time, and most of them are worthy, but you can't do it all. So as you think about 2013, what structure can you use to help you manage the precious resource of your time? What can you use to help you prioritize your time? Maybe it's as simple as getting a calendar or a day timer, or maybe you have an app for that. How about a, a weekly planning session with your spouse? 
Guys, I want to give you a valuable tip. It'll save you a lot of fights on Friday afternoon if you'll sit down on Monday with your spouse and talk about how you're going to spend your weekend ahead of time. And that's good preaching. <laughs> how are you going to invest your time in 2013? Time is life. How are you going to structure your time to make sure that you invest it well? I'm going to skip forward a little bit and talk about another precious resource that I find in Acts chapter 6, which is money. Which is money. Time and money. The apostles put a structure in place to manage the money. Beloved, look at me for a second. If you want to know what has facilitated the growth of harvest time over 29 years, it's that we structured for it. This December, we'll celebrate our 30th anniversary, and we're still growing strong. In the early 1970s, I got saved into the Jesus movement. And although there were many wonderful things about that movement, later in life, I learned that some of the leaders read their rebellious, anti-establishment values into the book of Acts and into their ecclesiology. They supposed that the book of Acts church was a loosely organized church. They supposed that it was some kind of informal collection of house meetings, some kind of ongoing Holy Ghost love-in. Listen, if that's your preference, you can go for it. I have kumbaya with better men of the Spirit than you. But whatever you start, it will not endure long term without a Holy Spirit approved structure. The early church, listen to me, the early church was well organized. It was structured and orderly and it was constantly evolving. An organization is never needed more than when money is involved. Even a home church, even a home fellowship church, once it starts collecting money, must put a structure in place for handling it or it won't be long at all before the fights break out. Beloved, I honestly believe that the reason that more believers don't receive as much financial blessing from the Lord as he wants to send is because they have no structure in place to handle the money if it came. Listen, the oil did not start flowing in the widow's house until she had the structures assembled to receive it. And as soon as the structures could contain no more, the oil stopped flowing. And it's the same with us too. How many of you have asked God at the beginning of the year, God, would you give me more financial provision in 2013 than you gave me in 2012? Come on, am I the only man in the room that prayed that? That's a good prayer right there. Lord, would you, would you bless me with more than you blessed me last year? Listen, if you've prayed that prayer, then get structured. Get yourself structured to receive it. If your income doubled or tripled in 2013, what would you do with the money? If you got a big bonus, if you got a, a big commission, if you received an inheritance, if you won the Powerball... What values and priorities would guide you in the handling of the wealth? You know, everybody has a dream about winning Powerball and building phase two. But the truth is, if you won't let go of the five bucks that's in your pocket today, you probably wouldn't give the five million tomorrow either. James said, you ask and you don't receive because you don't have any other plan but to consume it. What would happen if you put together a structure in 2013 that would enable God to bless you with significantly more finances than he did in 2012? Let me share a story with you, if I may. Denise and I are not responsible for many of the qualities that have made Harvest Time a great church over 29 years. When we got here in 1996, the church was already structured for long-term stability and sustainability. Pastor Tate did that. We were blessed to inherit a, a healthy, functioning leadership structure. But the Lord did help us to make some contributions along the way. When we came here, the treasurer's position was a floating seat on the board. That means that it was assigned among whomever might be on the board at the time. 
And sometimes there were men on the board that had the proper experience and education to manage money well, and sometimes there weren't. And we didn't have an annual budget. We prepared annual reports, but we didn't have an instrument for forecasting revenue and then forecasting how we were going to spend that. Pastor Tate had started from zero as a church plant. We, we just hadn't grown there yet. So I proposed some changes. We added a treasurer's seat to our board, and we put some provisions in place to make sure that it was always filled by somebody that has the proper uh, experience and know-how to manage money well. And we put an annual budget in place. And here's what happened. Listen, because there's a word from the Holy Spirit. If you'll latch on to it, you'll get blessed in 2013. Here's what happened when we put a budget in place. In the first 15 years of our history, our giving grew from zero to a half million dollars a year. After we put a budget in place in the next 10 years, our giving grew from a half million dollars a year to four million dollars a year. See, when there was a structure in place to receive it, God poured it out. Beloved, listen to me. This is a key for life. If you want to receive the financial reward of the Lord in 2013, I want you to leave this service, burn a smoky path home, sit down at your kitchen table, and I want you to start to write out your budget for 2013. I want you to put on the top line your tithe to Harvest Time Church, the first 10% of what God has entrusted to you. I want you to put on the second line your offerings to the Harvest Time missions, to the spread of the gospel here at home and around the world. Make the third line your planned sacrificial giving to phase two in 2013. Make the next line your savings, and at the very bottom line, put what you're going to do if God blesses you with way more than you expected. Get your structures in place and watch what God will do. Three areas to structure for 2013. Structure your thinking for future growth. Structure your resources for long-term sustainability. And finally this, structure your relationships for maximum impact. Structure your relationship with max, for maximum impact. Guys, look at me. Next to your relationship with God, nothing is more important than your relationships in life. In fact, it's impossible to talk about your relationship with God without talking about how it affects your relationship with others. And your relationship with others directly affects your relationship with God. If you're out of alignment in your relationship with others, the Bible says you're out of alignment in your relationship with God. The quality, listen to me, the quality of your life is largely determined by the quality of your relationships. The direction of your life is determined by the quality of the people that you relate to. I want to give you three qualities to look for very quickly in the people that you're going to partner with in 2013. Three qualities to look for in the people that you're going to partner with. The apostle said, choose seven men. Beloved, listen to me. Be choosy about the people that you partner with in life. How many of you remember choosy moms choose Jeff? All right, I want you to be a choosy mom. I want you to be a choosy dad. I want you to be choosy. Be choosy about whom you date. If you're not married, look at me. Be very choosy about whom you date. If our friend Pastor Jan Nell was here, he'd say, don't muck around. <laughs> don't waste your time dating people that you'd never consider marrying. Don't date for fun. Trust me, when the breakup comes, it won't be fun. Be choosy about whom you date. Whom you date, you marry. Be choosy about whom you marry. Be choosy about whom you embrace as lifelong friends. Be choosy about whom you do business with. Short-term gains, listen to me, are not worth the long-term headaches and heartaches. Actually, that word choose is of great interest to me. It's the same word that Jethro used in Exodus 18 when he advised Moses to choose leaders. Choose leaders from among the people. In Hebrew, it's the word to see. To see like a seer. 
to see like a prophet, to see with Holy Spirit insight, see from among the people, leaders. Beloved, as you look at people and consider them for lifelong friendships and partnerships and ministry fellowships, see with the insight of the Holy Spirit. Don't look on the outside as man does, but weigh the character, weigh the speech that belies the contents of the heart. So quickly, let me give you three things to look for when choosing your relationships. Number one, partner with people who are committed to his call. Partner with people who are committed to his call to be witnesses. In the old King James Bible, Acts 6 says, Choose from among you men of good reputation. Actually, what it literally says is choose men who are known to be good witnesses. As in, you shall receive power from the Holy Ghost and you shall be my witnesses. The quality to look for goes far beyond someone who is respectable. The quality to look for is someone who is committed to the call of Jesus. Someone who's identity in life is rooted first in knowing Jesus and whose first mission in life is to make him famous. Beloved, when I'm looking for people to partner with, I'm looking for people who believe like me that the business of the kingdom of God is the most important business in the entire world. I want to tell you our cause is the greatest cause that ever was. The work that we do right here is more important than the work they do on Wall Street. It's more important than the work that they do in Washington, D.C. It's more important than the work that they do in Hollywood and a whole lot more uh, productive and fruitful. It's the work of the eternal salvation of the souls of men and women. And when I'm looking for people to partner with, I'm looking for people who believe that. Be choosy. Second thing to look for, partner with people of the Spirit. Choose seven men known to be good witnesses and full of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes to highlight two manifestations of the Spirit. Choose men, what it literally says, what it literally reads is choose men full of the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit and full of the faith that comes from the Holy Spirit. Beloved, I want to tell you there is a wisdom that comes down from above that surpasses the carnal, sensual, devilish wisdom of this world. It's the wisdom that rested on Joseph in Egypt. It's the wisdom that rested on Daniel in Babylon. It's the wisdom that rested on Mordecai and on Esther. It rested on David in Saul's court. It rested on Solomon, his son, and it's recorded in the book of Proverbs. The Holy Spirit is able to give you supernatural insight. Listen to me. The Bible says that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So the wisdom that the Holy Spirit is able to give you is not just for your spiritual life, your walk with Christ, or, or even just for your managing your family. He's able to give you supernatural insight for business. Word of wisdom. Word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, revelation that follows tongues, dreams, visions, prophetic words. Ye shall hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Choose to partner with people who move in those gifts. And choose to partner with people who have the gift of faith. Nothing drives me crazier. And when I sit with a group of people and we talk about a proposal and they tell me all the reasons why it can't be done, makes me nuts. I like to hang around people who believe that we have a great big God who still does great big miracles on the earth. <laughs> Choose people who believe God's promises over the world's prognostications. Be choosy about your relations. Choosy moms, choose Jeff. Be choosy. Finally this, partner with people. Melissa, you better help me. We're in trouble. Partner with people who have a vision for the future. Partner with people who have a vision for the future. Everybody look at me. The Greek-speaking segment of the congregation was hurt. They felt like they were being treated like second-class citizens. So the apostles chose seven Greek-speaking men to pastor them. It was a bold move. It was a forward-looking move. 
Jesus had called them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, and the apostles realized that that meant leaving the Hebrew, Aramaic-speaking world and going out into the Greek-speaking world. It was a forward-looking move on their part. And if you read on in the book of Acts, you'll discover that Stephen had his finger on the pulse of where things were headed, of where things were going. Stephen was the first person in the book of Acts to suggest, consistent with the prophecies of Jesus, that the whole Jewish hierarchy and the whole temple worship system was no longer relevant to God's work on earth. And when Stephen suggested that, it got him killed. Stephen knew where it was all going, perhaps even better than the apostles themselves at that moment. Beloved, find people with a vision for the future and make them your partners. And for heaven's sake, look at me, for heaven's sake, in 2013, look forward. It's 2013, listen to this word. It's 2013 begins. Let's not spend any more time lamenting what is gone.